history by Rabbi Avraham Mordechai Gottlieb, who I'll be referring to as the Rebbe Shlita. We are on page 73 of giving. We are on section 7. Let's jump in. So the bullet point to start off this section is, starting with a question. Why weren't we created cleaving to God from the beginning? In the last class we talked about cleaving, the vacus, which is the ultimate thing that we're reaching for. Absolute adhesion and union with the Creator. Meaning similarity of form, to be one with His aspect. Just as He is loving, so too we should be loving, compassionate, giving, etc. So the second bullet point kind of answers the question and we'll go into it. We would be humiliated by receiving from God without deserving it. So we have tort and mitzvot in order to earn it. The Bala Sulam begins. However, here the Kabbalists pause and ask, why weren't we created with the required lofty stature so we could be cleaving to God from the beginning? What reason did God have to shoulder us with this burden in trouble of the creation and the Torah and the mitzvot? The Rabbi Shlita says, The creation itself is a nuisance, for the fact that a person who is actually a soul must be enclosed in the material substance of flesh and blood. This is a great bother. Our need to deal with the body is a great bother, even for the body itself, and all the more so for the soul. For the stench of the body reaches the heavens, both in physical terms and also in terms of its value. For the end of the physical body testifies to its nature from the beginning. Nothing but decay. The body of our spiritual self, which is our desire to receive, is also a great bother. For we will never be satisfied. Whoever gets one measure of something will then want the double measure. Torah and mitzvot are also a great bother for the body. For, quote, a slave prefers licentiousness. From Mesechet Gittin 13a, from the Babylonian Talmud. And does not want any limitation, any laws, or any subjugation. Thus, the whole framework of Torah and mitzvot is a great bother for us. So, for what purpose did the Creator place upon us all of this nuisance? So, there can only be one king. And it's either going to be the king of kings, or us. We choose. And this is seeming to imply that, in essence, our will to receive is infinite. We really are an endless pit. We emulate the Creator Himself in our desire to be ever-consuming. An example of that, in the most exaggerated way, would be, as we've mentioned in a prior class, celebrities who keep on buying and buying and buying and fulfilling their base desires to try to fill what we like to call, essentially, the desire to cleave to the Creator. And all the pleasures in the meantime are simply a hero to kick, a thin line of pleasure that does not amount to anything close to the pleasure of spirituality. To continue, the Baal Salaam says, They replied, Whoever benefits from another's work is ashamed to look at him or her in the face. From the Jerusalem Talmud, Orla, chapter 1, Halacha 3. Explanation. If you eat and get benefit from the labor of another person, you'll be afraid to look upon the image of his or her face, for you'll become increasingly humiliated until you lose the character of a human being. And since whatever comes forth from God's perfection could never be found lacking, therefore God gave us room to earn for ourselves the desired goal, namely cleaving to God, the vegut by virtue of our deeds in Torah and mitzvot. Let's read that again inside with the Rabbi Shlita's commentary. They replied, Whoever benefits from another's work is ashamed to look at him or her in the face. 
from the Jerusalem Talmud, Orla chapter 1, halacha 3. Explanation. If you eat and get benefit from the labor of another person, you'll be afraid to look upon the image of his or her face. For you'll become increasingly humiliated until you lose the character of a human being. The Rishita says here, the difference between a person and an animal is only in one feature. Our ability to function beyond our given nature of receiving and to arrive at a state of loving the other. By contrast, the animals are incapable of going against their nature and are thereby enslaved by their nature of self-love. If we derive benefits for ourselves from another's work as a free gift and do not at all consider the other person's welfare, then we are not worthy of the title human being. Therefore, God provided the feeling of shame when people receive a free gift, so that no one would simply remain in this attitude, but everyone will eventually make a change to fix it. To summarize this point by the Rabbi Shlita, animals by nature are receiving, and people are attempting to become giving. So what separates us is being able to rise above that nature. At the same time, there is a holy aspect to the concept of animal. To call ourselves beasts, or in Hebrew, behemot, is a bitter idea. To say that we're debased, and most of the day we do simple things like eat, sleep, and rinse and repeat. But we're greater than that. At the same time, behema in Hebrew is the same gematria as ban. Ban is the final partsuf. Partsuf is from the language of face. It's a delineation, it's an expression of the light of the Creator. And there's different levels of the light that diminish downward until we get to this tiny dot and manifestation that is our physical world. And the spiritual worlds, being the states of consciousness that we reach, expand the light and open up our perspective, our wisdom, our ability to be giving and loving and godlike. I won't go so deep into the parts of him themselves. This is more of a hashkafic, you know, philosophical work, uh, but obviously speaks and hints at certain Kabbalistic concepts. And this is the foundation, in essence, at least one of them, of the Kabbalah. So, Ban being the last partsuf, the partsufim being Galgalta, which is corresponding to the highest light, Yechida, oneness with the Creator. Then there is partsuf Ab, spelled Ein Bet, Gematria of 72. That is corresponding to Chochma, the wisdom of the Creator, which is the purpose of creation, receiving in order to bestow. Then there is partsuf Sag, Samech Gimel, Partsuf. Sag is Gematria 63. That is corresponding to the sphere of Bina. That is the aspect of just giving. Giving to give is the state of consciousness. Then there is Ma, Memhe, Gematria 45, which is the Gematria of Adam, man. Man is capable of rising to this level of Ma, and Ma corresponding to the sphere of Teferis or Zeranpin, small face, being a small illumination of the light of the Creator, whereas higher illuminations are available for us to achieve. Again, I'm not going into too much detail, I'm just planting some seeds. And the final parts of his ban, Bet Nun, Gematria 52, just like Behema. Ban is corresponding to the lowest sirot of Malchut. Everything is the Malchut. The Malchut is corresponding to many different names, being the collective soul of humanity. Knesset Yisrael, the congregation or assembly of Yisrael on high. The Shekhinah, the feminine manifestation of the Creator, His presence, so to speak. But all of our souls added together, the sum of our souls is the Shekhinah. We are the feminine expression of the Creator because we are the vessel that's receiving His light and His life force that brings us into being and that keeps us in motion. 
Why am I going into this? Because Behema, being the same gematria as Ban, as the Rebbe Zitzal, Rebbe Baruch Shalom Ashlag, has illuminated. And the Rebbe Shlita have also heard speak about this concept. The holy aspect of an animal is related to Malchut, because Malchut is also corresponding to the idea of Malchut Shemayim, the kingdom of heaven, which corresponds to the notion of the yoke of heaven. When we speak about Malchut Shemayim, the ideal way to correct and rectify the Malchut, which is the lowest sphere and therefore the most coarse, the most egoistic, the most wanting to receive for itself alone aspect, in fact, delineated as receiving in order to receive, the lowest level. But because it's the most coarse, it can bring the most light. Just like the most weight, assuming you can handle it, builds the most muscle. So too, just like a beast, just like an animal, puts on its load, like a donkey, or an ox that puts on its yoke. So too, we can desire to be like holy animals and put on the yoke of heaven. Animals and really anything under the level of consciousness of Midaber, speaking, being humans, so inanimate, plant, and animal, are all operating off of a system. They're fulfilling their role perfectly, especially relative to us. We're the balagan, so to speak, we're the mess that's trying to fix itself and help be a partner in creation, and fix the world, all the worlds, really. But to be a holy animal is to take on that yoke in order to do the work and to also operate on the basis of the creator's operating system of just doing the work, just giving to give, even if it's not tasty, even if it doesn't feel good. Because we're all about feelings. But the essence of the yoke of heaven, the essence of being an evid Hashem, a servant or a worker of the creator, has nothing to do with feelings. It has to do with the truth. And that's we and, and it's that we have the amazing merit and opportunity to attempt to serve him. As we've spoken about in our prior class, we would be so happy to serve the greatest rabbi or celebrity or athlete that we look up to. We might even pay money and able to serve them because serving them is actually a benefit and a receiving on our end. How much more so the creator of the universe that pumps our blood every second saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. So, back to the Baal Sulam. Gonna finish off this paragraph and then the Second comment by the Rabbi Shlita. And since whatever comes forth from God's perfection could never be found lacking, because he's perfect, therefore God gave us room to earn for ourselves the desired goal, namely cleaving to God, by virtue of our deeds in Torah and mitzvot. The Rabbi Shlita says, Therefore the Creator did not create as perfect, for if he had done so, we would not have had any need to do spiritual work. Thus, we would be receiving from God the divine revelation, which is the eternal good and joy He intended to give, as a free gift without any work on our part. And then naturally, there would be the defective element of shame. And since God is perfect, such an imperfect act would not be fitting for Him. So, God arranged that we would earn our perfection through our labor. And then, when we receive the eternal good and delight, that he wants to impart to us, we will have a feeling of perfection. Bala Sulam asked regarding the above, how can work in this fleeting world entitle one to eternal joy? Although it's true that when we get paid for our work, we usually don't feel that we are in the role of a receiver at all. And so we don't feel ashamed. Nonetheless, someone who receives a yearly salary for only one day's work would still feel a full measure of shame. How much more so, living and hopefully putting in the inner work, 70, 80 years, God willing, 120 years or more for all of us, and earning eternity? 
that's still shameful. It still makes no sense. It's the biggest miracle that we can comprehend that as debased flesh and blood beings, we can achieve absolute perfection, being one with the Creator, especially given our short time on this pale blue dot. The Rabbi Shita continues, The answer to this is that our sages did not intend to say that our labor merits us to receive reward as an exchange for our labor, but rather that through the process of doing spiritual work, we acquire the desire to give selflessly. So, if you could attain the desire to give after work for only 10 minutes, then even this would save you from the shame of receiving a free gift. For all the shame derives from the fact that a person is receiving selfishly. But if you completely restrict your receiving and perform all your actions only in order to give to the other, then shame no longer applies. For shame does not apply to one who only gives. To state it in terms of our relationship with God, if you receive divine light due to your love of God, because you know that God's desire is for you to receive, then you'll have no feeling of shame in receiving. Thus, we've made clear that the significance of our spiritual work is different from what it seems superficially. It is not the exchange of labor for reward of equal value, for this is impossible because the work is temporary and the reward is eternal. Rather, the import of our labor is the desire of the Creator that created being acquired the nature of giving selflessly. And at the moment that we attain this, shame is no longer relevant. This explains the idea of toil in the saying of our sages. Quote, if someone says, I toiled and did not find it, don't believe it, end quote. From Masechet Megillah 6b of the Babylonian Talmud. That is, if someone says that he or she worked to attain the character of giving selflessly, but did not find the light of God's countenance, don't believe it. For it is just an indication that he or she has not yet done the work bidding to attain the desire to give selflessly. So as we see, toiling in Torah, as we understand it, based on our tradition, is not specifically sitting and learning in front of a book and toiling inside the book. That might be an aspect. But as we've noted in the prior class, these books, this wisdom is just that. It's wisdom in itself. It's information. And it doesn't necessarily mean that just by learning it, we're going to become refined. The Rabbi Shita says, as quoted in Inner Work, in his book, Hakdam al page 185, page 81 at the top in Inner Work. Many people who learn Torah think that the learning itself is everything. Everyone is certain that learning the entire Gomorrah, being the Talmud, is a high level, as one acquires the information that is written in the Torah. It is believed that the learning itself fixes our souls and that this is what God wants from us. Some people think that when all of Israel knows the Torah like they do, then Mashiach will come. This is not what it says in the Zohar. Interestingly, the Zohar was written around the same time as the Tanaim, the Tanaim of the Tanakh period of the Mishnah, where at least many of them, particularly Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, wrote the Zohar, at least it's attributed to him by our tradition. Meaning to say that traditionally today we believe that toiling is just learning, and that has nothing to do seemingly with inner work. But we see here that's not the case. Toiling is specifically in order to do the inner work, 
It's specifically in order to refine ourselves, in order to give and to love, and to be in similarity of form with the Creator. And just learning the information is not necessarily going to do that. To the point of our last lesson, it might even do the opposite. We're sick. We have a Ratzon Lakabel. We have a will to receive. And it needs its medicine. The medicine, as described by our sages, is Torah. The Torah is the healing condiment. But Torah, as we see here, the real toiling in Torah is with the intention to refine. And the biggest light that is drawn from the Torah in order to do that refinement is the Kabbalah. Which, thank God, we are at least touching the tip of the iceberg here. Because there's so, so much to learn and it's so very sweet. The Baal Salaam finishes off this section with These matters are most profound. And I've already explained them fully in the first chapters of my book, Panim Must Be Wrote, which is his first commentary in the Eitz Chaim. And in the first section of the Talmud of the Ten Sirot, in the commentary titled Histaklut Pnimit. Here I'll explain them briefly so that they will be understood by all. And that's where we end the section. The next class will be section 8 on page 76, and we're going to go into a little bit more depth regarding the dynamics of receiving free gifts and shame, and why it is that the Creator gave us such an amazing opportunity to refine ourselves to the tournament's vote. We clarified a lot in this class, but we're always trying to get deeper. And even as we review, we always find more and more. We're literally digging golden nuggets from all types of learning, assuming that we have intention to at least attempt to give, an attempt to refine. It says in the Torah that we told the Creator when we received the Torah, Nasi v'nishma. We will do and then we will hear. We understand the dynamic that we have to put in the work. We have to be like the holy animal, the behemoth that puts on the malchut, the malchut shamayim, the yoke of heaven, and say, I'm going to serve you. And those who ask for refinement, those who ask for help, are given help from above. So if we really want to refine, if we want to start this process on the path of truth, on the path of refinement to become altruistic, to become righteous, tzaddikim, then it's incumbent to start this work. So, until next time, thank you for tuning in. Please check out the description. It's got free PDF downloads, of course, to some amazing books, as well as other resources. Uh, if you have any questions, my email should be at the bottom of the description. And God willing, I'll continue soon. All the best.